Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Steve Oldenberg and I'm the founder and CEO of NanoComposites. Today I'm going to be talking about nanosafety, conclusions from a decade of nanotox research. For over 10 years we've been helping supply material to toxicologists so that they can understand the effects of nanoparticles on the environment and human health. Our role is not only to supply the materials but also to help toxicologists integrate those materials into their experiments. This is important because with nanoparticles it's not just about PPM exposure levels, there are many other factors that need to be incorporated into an experimental design in order for the data obtained from the experiments to be valuable and reproducible. Since the inception of nanotechnology more than three decades ago, there's been a concern that nano was somehow inherently dangerous. This was propagated by books such as Prey by Michael Crichton with its self-replicating nanobots, but also throughout the popular media where scientific results would get picked up by the news outlets, often reporting results that didn't have the right context. All of this interest led to the inception of a new field called nanotoxicology that was dedicated to determining the risks associated with nanoparticles and their impact on the environment and human health. Now it turns out that exposure to small particles isn't new. We've been exposed to nanoparticles since the dawn of time. The vast majority of nanoparticles released into the environment are due to natural or industrial processes. Originally this research was called the study of ultrafine nanoparticles. About 20 years ago, it got reclassed as the study of nanoparticles and became the field of nanotoxicology. Now, what's new is that as things advance technology-wise, the production of larger quantity of engineers' nanoparticles have the potential to be released into the environment. And this has led to a new focus on understanding the safety of these emerging materials. So to determine safety, we have to consider a number of factors. Ultimately, the goal is to build a set of structure activity relationships that can predict the risk associated with an untested nanomaterial. We start with the physical chemical properties of the material itself. This is the physical chemical ID. And there's a whole bunch of components that are important to understand that are different than the traditional chemical characteristics that toxicologists usually incorporate into their experiments. Once we have the materials, we can design experiments to, to, to look at their hazard. And this has a number of integration challenges because nanoparticles behave differently than traditional chemicals. Finally, we've got exposure. Ultimately, if we're not exposed, we're not at risk. And so we have to understand what are the unique characteristics of nanoparticles that might impact our exposure. And ultimately, how do we get from exposure to hazard and risk and really understand what the, uh, what's going to happen when these particles are released in the environment and what do we need to be concerned about. The, the, like I said, the, the history of nanocomposites goes, goes way back uh, to 2007. There was a, an early uh, Air Force SBIR that was sponsored by Dr. Saber Hussein at, um, at the Air Force. And what he recognized was that in this emerging field of nanotox, there, there, was, a, there was a problem. There were lots of groups reporting results that were very inconsistent. And, and it was making it difficult to determine where to focus effort and, and how to move the field forward. And one of the, the main problems that, that he identified was the lack of um, consistent starting materials. So the materials, people were ordering them um, uh, from Sigma Aldrich and getting dried powders and sprinkling these aggregated dried particles on cells and then reporting some results. And of course, those results were, were, were very different and, and somewhat confusing. So the idea behind this SBIR was, can we create these libraries of, of very well-controlled materials that are going to allow the researchers to get relevant data um, that's going to be reproducible, and we can start to make some connections between the physical properties and their, their ultimate toxicity and, and risk. So, we, you know, had this uh, this library that got built up with, you know, precisely controlled di different sizes, different shapes, making sure things were unagglomerated. Spent a lot of time purifying and concentrating materials to make sure that the uh, the effects were just from the nanoparticles themselves and not from residuals. Making more um, multifunctional or complex materials to tease out some of the nuances, and then overlaying that with this extensive characterization. So the, the particles that we focus on, which is really just a subset of the, of the nanomaterials that are of interest in the nanotox space, but we, it's mostly in the metals and metal oxides. And here we've got a core, core materials of um, gold and silver. Some of the plasmonic materials uh, have very um, precise and interesting ways of controlling their shape and optical properties. Uh, materials like iron oxide that are magnetic, titanium dioxide, which is high index and photocatalytic, and then we've got some other um, materials like silica and, um, and copper oxide that are 
uh, used as, uh, in some cases, antimicrobial, and in some cases as sort of a, a, st a structure or a scaffold to, to put other elements on. We can coat those with a particular surface, and we can uh, overlay that with a, an actual shell. So we can build up these core shell layers that, that have um, different properties as well. And then in addition to spherical properties or spher spherical particles, we can also do all these different shapes. And each one of these components actually is, is quite important. And, and when you change something in this, uh, in this construction, you can end up with a completely different biological interaction. So sort of libraries of where, where experimenters are able to get these vectors of, of just changing one thing at a time are pretty important for, for kind of understanding what's going on and, and, uh, and moving forward. So the, the benefit of, of the SBIR was that we were able to, to really provide materials and then interact with the, the toxicologists. And so some of the early experiments, this was uh, some work done by Nancy Montiero Riviere where we had provided them some materials, they had seen some toxicity, we had tried to tease out what the reason for that was, and it turned out that there were some residual reactants in that uh, initial solution, and once we purified it, that toxicity went away. away. So that was you know, very early on and really emphasized the, the importance of, of purifying. You, you, we want to understand that the effects that they're seeing are from the nanoparticles themselves and not from, from something else from the, from the manufacturing process. So that led to us you know, not only doing purification, but measuring for endotoxin, trying to keep things sterile, all of the other elements that could be um, convoluting or, or affecting the assay besides the particles. The other issue, um, which is what we refer to, is, is transformation. And, and, and the problem here is, is that the nanoparticles aren't static. And, and this is a little bit unusual from what people were used to using it in, in toxicology, where you've got this chemical and you've you had to add it at the certain parts per million, and, and that was really what you had to worry about. It. Here, the, the nanoparticles have a whole bunch of different, um, a different, different characteristics. Uh, so we are um, we're trying to um, to make sure that, that that's all, all all going well, and that we sort of understand how these things are being altered with time, because we, we need to uh, make sure that everybody's starting at the at the same spot. So one of the ways that, that we got around that was for, for some materials, we used uh, silver nanoparticles that were in a dried format. And previously, we had told people that, that drying, uh, drying components was not uh, a good idea because the particles would be permanently aggregated. Uh, but we found a way to, to dilophilize them, and then they can just be, you can add water, and they'll sort of pop right back up and, and be in an aggregate state. And this was used by NIST, which had, you know, had this problem because they certainly um, were being required to provide a spec sheet that was absolutely reliable, but if they used liquid nanoparticles, they would change with time. So what they would do is we'd start with this freeze-dried formulation, it provide sort of a ground zero um, after dissolution, and then things could be, be characterized after that. So in terms of uh, going forward, then that gives us this sort of the physical chemical characteristics that, that, we, that we needed to know. But the, you know, the question that the, the toxicologists were asking was, well, what are the things that are different? Why, you know, what, what do I have to be worried about or should I be thinking about when I'm designing my nanotoxicology experiment? And there's a, there's a number of factors that make nanomaterials different than, than the standard chemicals. And I'm just going to run through them, them quickly to, to give a kind of a, a flavor of the extra things that, that think people need to be, be thinking about. So in terms of... Um, uh, the, the most obvious one, which is just size. So there's a, a number density and a surface area per unit mass that increases as a function um, uh, of size as these particles get smaller. So the, uh, when you're down in that, that 100 or 10 or even down to the 2 nanometers, the number of particles per unit mass is, is greatly increased. The surface area is greatly increased, and that's something that, that we have to think about. And, and then the size also has a, a dependency for, for fate and transport. These, these particles are on the order of the size of a virus. They're going to be handled by biology differently than, than some, some particles that are, that are much larger. The, uh, the second thing is, uh, is surface charge. So the, the particles themselves, when they're suspended in solution, have a, um, 
a double layer that, that keeps them stable and repels them from each other and, and allows them to remain individual. And that surface charge will, if it's a negatively charged particle, it's going to be attracted to positively charged surfaces or positively charged particles and they could potentially interact. So that surface charge is one of the primary ways that we think about how these, uh, these particles interact in, in a solution. We've got the, the surface coating, which you know, also impacts the, the surface charge but has other functions that can sterically uh, sterically keep the particles stable uh, and in some cases the surface coating can be designed to target or, or recognize uh, certain things in, in solution if it's coated with in, for instance an antibody or some other uh, biological targeting moiety. Um, the, uh, the other things that we can look at are composition. I mentioned earlier that silver uh, was, was relatively dynamic. It has a dissolution constant in water and over time uh, it can release ions and, and in the case of silver or copper those, those ions are toxic. So it becomes a, you know, it's, it's not necessarily that the nanoparticles themselves are a, uh, have a, a very high toxicity but it could be that the ions that are they're releasing in that local environment do you know, impact the, the toxicity or the, the effect of um, them on, on, on the environmental biological system that's around them. The morphology is also important. There's a, you know, asbestos was a good example of a, of a structure that, um, that became much more hazardous uh, because of its shape. And there was a concern in the nanotoxicology space that the same thing would happen with, with nanomaterials. And that um, was true to some extent, but in, in most cases it, it wasn't as dramatic as, uh, as the asbestos example. So here we've got a, a wide range of sizes and shapes that can all affect uh, surface absorption, stability, transport and, and uptake. The, the band gap, this is a sort of a select group of materials um, but um, is important so sometimes with, with materials with a band gap if they're excited they can um, that can impact their optical properties, the redox properties or the, the uh, reactive oxygen generation potential of, of the material. Very small particles um, uh, are used in uh, catalysis, and that's because they have, have surface area and, and nanoscale structure that they enhance the reactivity of, of certain processes. So that enhanced reactivity, either at air, you know, at just because of that surface area or at edges and corners, um, uh, can, can drastically affect uh, how, the, how the particles interact with, with different compounds. Plasmonics is you know, one of the things that we do here. This is where we're using materials, mostly gold and silver, that have very strong interactions with incident light and that can magnify the electro local electromagnetic field, again, influencing some of the, the characteristics of the particles in biology. And then finally, we've got phase stability, where you know, at, at the smallest sizes, um, there's, a, there's a difference between the bulk and the, and the nanoscale dynamics as we, as we change phase. This is most often seen in, in um, sintering, so where you've got very small particles and if you, get, you, you apply a, a heat that's much below the bulk melting point, you can still get the particles to stick together. And this just has to do with the, the high curvature and the, the high surface area of the, of the materials themselves. So the, oh, and the one, one more is, a, is defects. So we've got synthetic materials that are, um, uh, that can be influenced by um, having a, an impurity in them. And then, uh, and that impurity can actually lead to the last one, which is instability. So here you can have these small particles that uh, can change with, with time. And, and again, this is another concept that don't, this isn't usually seen in, in, the, uh, in the bulk field where due to that curvature of the particles, they can release ions and that uh, the, the particle size distribution can, can, can change with time. So it's almost like you had a, a bucket of marbles with very large marbles and small marbles and the next day you'd expect to come back and it all, that size distribution would be the same. And with nanomaterials, that sometimes that's not the case. And sometimes you can have the smallest particles going away at the expense of the larger particles. So all things that, you know, if you were coming from a straight toxicology background, you wouldn't necessarily be thinking um, about this sort of level of change or dynamics or range of properties within the, the chemical that, uh, that you're studying. So this gets us back to our, uh, our sort of overview and we've got, a, uh, we've, we've got this idea of, of the physical chemical properties and we've got all of these, you know, these nano specific things that we're going to worry about or be concerned about when we design our, our experiments uh, going, going forward. And, um, and so that's really going to provide a, a framework for, for, for sort of designing what, what, what happens next and, and where we need to and where we need to go. 
So in terms of the experiments themselves, we've got, um, we, you know, there was there was quite a bit that was new uh, for 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 integrating, you know, as we went from sort of fundamental research to the you know the ultimate goal, which is predicting a biological response from from these nanomaterials. And we've got all these data gaps and and some some challenges associated with with filling those data gaps. So again, and some of those problems, I won't read them all off here, but we've got you know, some, some instrumentation, some analytics challenges, measuring the particles when they're in these complex biological matrices. Uh, we've got dosing issues. We've got uh, new protocols that, you know, for how to handle these materials and their, their aggregation state as a function of time. And so all of these, all of these problems are sort of things that, that the community is, was, was trying to address over the last, last um, 10 years and, and literally, you know, thousand plus papers kind of looking at the impact and influence uh, of nanomaterials in these, in these biological systems. And, you know, th and this talk, I'm actually not going to talk so much about the results of that. Um, but I did want to highlight that, that we are making progress and that, um, you know, this is a, a paper from uh, Dr. Hu Saber Hussein's group, and and so here they're you know finally getting to to make some some predictions or some generalizations, design rules really for how these different characteristics uh, of nanoparticles affect their their ultimate toxicity. So. They, um, if, you, if you read the paper, they talk um, about size being um, being a, definitely a trend. So decreasing the particle size generally increases the toxicity and the and the amount of cellular uptake. For charge, there's a, a generalization that in, in most cases, positively charged nanomaterials are more toxic due to their, their in, increased interactions with primarily negatively charged biological surfaces and entities. Uh, from a composition perspective, if there was a, a, a rate of ionic dissolution and those ions were toxic, there was definitely a correlation between between that and and, and the ultimate toxic result. And uh, in morphology, where where, where rod uh, or anisotropic shapes were, were taken up less efficiently, but once they were there, they could introduce um, uh, more significant more significant damage. The the reason why this is um, so important is, is, is twofold. One is that we might be able to make some estimates or some predictions of a new material that we haven't studied yet on what its toxicity might be if we have these design rules. And the other one is, is that we can also use these, these rules to design safer materials. For instance, um, in nanomedicine, it's really important that we uh, we understand that the things that we're injecting into the body are, are going to go to the right place and aren't going to cause damage. So there's a whole sort of secondary field coming up with uh, nano safety and, and really thinking about how to make sustainable nanomaterials for safer design of uh, uh, of components that could ultimately end up in, in nanotherapies and, and be used for treatment. So one of the one of the themes that that I try to present when I when I talk to the toxicology crowd is that the you know while you're they're out sort of looking for things to, to protect the community or to identify risks, there's also this other side where they're they're providing a foundation for for some of these future nanomedicine, nanobiology type interactions where the data that they're obtaining is actually very interesting for, for that community for that community as well. So going back to our, our sort of map of, of how, to, how to delegate risk, the, the last component I haven't talked about is, um, is exposure. So most of the experiments to date have been done um, with, with pristine systems and because it's, you, you really want to try and find out what's going on. And if you start with a very complex material, it's, it's very difficult to determine which component of that of that matrix or that that complexity is is causing the effect. So there's been a lot of pristine studies, but that's really not what we're exposed to. We're exposed to materials that are integrated into composites. We're comp um, exposed to uh, nanomaterials that are potentially made with with uncontrolled, unpurified processes and, and and are very complex. So it's important to to recognize that some of the results that are coming out of the um, pristine experiments might not be completely relevant to the um, to you know to an actual risk because because it's just unlikely that that's going to be an exposure route. So if we take a, if we take that a little further, we can we can look at, at where the split is in, in has been in in terms of um, the studies that have gone on and, and it really has been dominated by that hazard spot. So we've got a few. 
uh, most of the most of the studies in in hazard, we've got some fate and transport, and then there's a a smaller component that's that's really due to this uh, to this exposure uh, question. And you can uh, you can think about exposure. You have to really think about the the life cycle. So you know, what does exposure mean? Well, it, it can mean different things at different stages in that life cycle. So from a manufacturing perspective, we've got you know the handling and the making of the particles themselves. There might be some injection molding process or some nanocomposite process of, of, of processing things to get things in. And then once it moves into commercial consumer use, then there's a whole other range of, um, of elements that uh, could happen to that material. UV degradation, uh, thermal degradation, hot or cold, we could get some leaching, some, some biodecomposition. There's some mechanical elements to that. We could have abrasion or deformation or sanding or drilling. All of those things might, might release, a, re release a particle. And then we've got more end of life um, type of consideration. So once, once that, um, that item's been discarded, is it going to be recycled? Is it going to go into some sort of a landfill? If it's in a landfill, is there a degradation process there? If it's incinerated, is there a possibility that there could be something that would be released from, from that thing? So when, when we're talking about exposure, we've got to kind of really think about this, this much more complex degradation process and, and, and life cycle. So if we take a, a concrete example of, you know, um, so for instance, a, a carbon nanotube uh, reinforced uh, composite polymer, and these the carbon nanotubes are being added to increase the strength, uh, but there's a concern that um, what happens if those particles get out? What happens if carbon nanomaterials are released? And they could that could happen presumably by weathering, and you might lose some of the the resin, and you would get these these um, these carbon nanotubes that could uh, be individualized and, and potentially be an exposure source. Um, they could have been mechanically ground down where you got them small enough and you would release these um, the carbon nanotubes themselves. So, so sort of the question is is in a in a, in a composite like environment like that, you know, w what is the exposure risk um, with a given given a particular life cycle of a material? So, this was uh, Stacy Harper's work, um, and she looked at a whole a whole slew of, of different um, composites and and, and nanomaterial or nanotube. Um, materials and, and they, they examined them and what they found was that while you can you can see the, uh, the the nanoparticles or the nanotubes in these in these particles that are that are released they, they basically across more than a dozen different studies didn't see any free uh, carbon nanotubes being released so and this has been sort of repeated in a, in a whole bunch of uh, different different things so it, it's, it's just really not that common when something is integrated um, for those particles to, to be released individually. And that's true for composites, and it's also true for uh, just solutions of nanoparticles. It, we, we spend a, an enormous amount of time at nanocomposites trying to keep our particles from aggregating, from you know coalescing and getting bigger or depositing out or plating, because because it's it's that's almost their natural state. That's really where they're they're going to go unless you're unless you're careful. And so, uh, that tends to be what happens in 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 the real world. Things will start out in a nano form, but over time they're generally going to to end up in a in some sort of a, a larger composite that that's going to be less likely to have some of these specific nanomaterial um, dissolution and, and transport issues. So, so where does that leave us? So we've got a, uh, a lot that's been learned on the particle side, much better particles that are being characterized. That, na that knowledge of what's important has been transferred to the, the toxicologist. They've done an, um, an enormous amount of work on on understanding the effect of the individual nanomaterials, and then we're just now taking that data, incorporating it into real-world examples for exposure ID, and, and coming down to a, to a potential risk. And the the conclusion, which you know is is good, um, is that and this is a quote from um, some work from Dr. Grassian. Uh, that did sort of a, a recent review paper in Environmental Science Nano and, and basically says, to date, no known human diseases or serious environmental impacts um, have been reported that are specific to engineered nanomaterials. So no doubt that is, um, that's good news. And I guess as a kind of a, a follow-up of that, what was interesting is I was at a, a, a GRC conference on environmental nanotoxicology last year, and there was a, a session with, a, with, with, a, with a, what I thought was kind of a surprising title, and that was uh, the challenges of reporting null results. And when you got into the session, what, what the 
um, what, the, what the topic was was that a lot of the materials that have been studied really didn't have a huge effect on um, on toxicity. There was just a lot of null results. There was a lot of things that that didn't have anything surprising associated with the nano element in, in terms of, of what you would have expected versus a, a, a bulk material. And the, the reason why I thought this was important is that um, they were having trouble getting those results published. Basically, the, the reviewers were saying, well, yeah, that's great, that's not interesting, and, and sort of move on. And you know, my comment to, to that, that community was that some of those null results may be the most important element of, um, of the work in that uh, a null result in nanotox is really a positive result in nano safety. And by understanding what surfaces, what sizes, what shapes, don't influence or, or don't elicit a, a toxicological response provides us with a, a working set or some guidelines on, on how to build these next generation delivery mechanisms and other elements of, of nanomedicines and nanotherapeutics that are going to be you know, extremely important in the future. So are we out of the woods? And um, I think the obvious uh, follow-up to that is, is absolutely not. But you know, we, you know, we, we have learned a lot. And there's, there's a couple of sort of big points that I, I kind of just wanted to emphasize and make. And one was that you know, the first thing is it's, it's, it's difficult to find examples of common processes that will release large quantities of engineered nanomaterials. Partly that's because there's just not a, a huge um, manufacturing um, uh, manufacturing industry that's associated with producing those materials right now, but it's it's also that a lot of the materials that would be risky are getting integrated into something else that just doesn't have that potential for release. The second thing is that if the nanoparticles are released into the environment, um, they're, they're typically rapidly aggregated, encapsulated, or otherwise sequestered into larger, safer materials. And so that's that's just a generally good news. And then the third thing is that the, the risks that are identified by many of the in vitro experiments um, if you look at it and you, and you extrapolate back from the exposure things, it, it's a little bit unrealistic. So even the results that are coming out of literature that yes, you know, uh, yes, this is toxic at this particular dose and that that, um, that level of toxicity uh, is increased over the, over the bulk, the actual um, risk or hazard associated with that from an exposure perspective is, is, relative, is relatively low. So, so where does that leave us? Well, I think we're we're really just getting started on on this. The you know the 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 overall conclusion of of the research from the nanotoxicology space is that it is incredibly complex and to the point where um, we're never really going to fully understand it. And but that said, um, we are we are learning we are learning a lot and um, and the things that we're learning I think you know transcend just the, the toxicology space um, in terms of our understanding of, of basic fundamental processes of materials interacting with biology. You know, very subtle differences in the properties can result in really surprising changes in vivo. Very slight changes in the in the size or the, the surface state can completely change the protein corona that gets absorbed onto a particle once it's introduced in vivo. There's huge challenges remaining in post-transformational characterization. How do we understand how these particles are changing once they're in the system? We have pretty good tools for understanding the particles before, but it's once they're introduced into a complex matrix, very difficult to, to figure out what's going on. There's all kinds of surface dynamics on that are going on that are, that are um, that complicated and, and hard to, to to really uh, drill down to, there's there's transport issues, there's elimination issues, and then there's the global problem of extending these results from the pristine materials to much more complex industrial byproducts. Um, continued nanotoxicology research is going to be absolutely essential for for us developing safer nanomaterials now and in the future, and then also providing this backbone for uh, the nanotherapies and the nanomedicine that's that's coming down the pipe. So with that, I wrap it up, and uh, then I'd be willing to to take any questions that that people have um, about uh, about the talk or, or or nanotoxicology in in, in general. 
Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'd like to thank our audience, too, for your attention. Uh, we're going to take some time, as Steve mentioned, just to um, kind of address some of the questions that were submitted. Um, if you still haven't uh, submitted a question and you'd like to, uh, please go ahead and just go ahead and type your question into the question pane. Um, I will try to go ahead and address that. Um, today. Our first question um, comes from uh, Sahir. <clears throat> what are the regulatory challenges in incorporating nanomaterial into commercial products? Okay, yeah, great question. So, so the FDA's take on nanomaterials is that there really isn't anything fundamentally different about how they're going to treat nanomaterials from how they've treated every other compound that's going through the FDA. And with the sense that what you need to do is you need to establish a, a reproducible process for making those materials. And once you have that reproducible process for, for making the materials, then there's a well-defined system for going through um, the, the safety and, and then the talks and, and then eventually the, you know, the, the distribution. Um, of how it how it gets distributed in in the body, and then we can go forward and make an assessment on on whether the the material is is safe or not. So there's yeah. So so while there the FDA is still trying to understand maybe some of the nuances of of those analytics and those methods, there's really nothing fundamentally different than is it you know make it reproducible study it and see if um, see if it has any adverse uh, reactions before you scale up and, and go to a, a, a real full efficacy clinical trial. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Our next question today uh, comes from Nancy. Uh, does interactions with cells and protein affect how nanopar nanoparticles behave in biological systems? Yeah, so so definitely. So, so the, you know, the, the, the particles will start out in one state, and as soon as you introduce them into a biological system, they are different. And you know, the first thing that happens is typically there'll be um, proteins or other other elements that are in solution that'll associate with that surface. And so now you've got a particle with a completely different surface. It's got a different charge, a different hydrophob uh, hydrophobicity, and that's going to control. Uh, basically, it's it's transport and it's ultimate dissolution uh, wherever it ends up. So, the you know the complexity of it is is that you know we start with one state, it gets transformed, and it's in sort of this constant flux as it moves into different compartments or gets exposed to different environments while it's in the environmental or biological system of interest. Thank you. Um, our next question today comes um, from Ben. Is it possible to purchase a bare surface um, of your particles, and then um, would this be less toxic? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. We get that all the time about naked and nude and bare, <laughs> bare nanoparticles. Um, so, so a particle, uh, you know, has to have, it always will have a surface. And, um, and what people typically mean when they ask for bare particles is they want something that's, that's stabilized with a molecule that's as easily displaceable as possible. So uh, what happens is that, you know, you've got a metal surface that's got an affinity for things. There's other stuff in solution. Things are going to associate. And if you don't have anything stabilizing the particle, then they will typically just aggregate and fall out of solution. So, so what, when we say bare, we, we think about what is the lowest affinity, smallest perturbation molecule that we can have on the surface that's still going to have it perform or remain stable as a nanoparticle. So our carbonate materials um, or our citrate materials are really the closest thing that you've got to, to being having that sort of naked state or bare state. And typically we'll start with that and we'll use that nakedness or that, um, you know, that, that low affinity to build up different surfaces. So if we add something with a higher affinity, that'll displace the, uh, the citrate or the carbonate, and that will um, impart a, a new surface to, to, the, to the particle that has some other functional char characteristic that's important and interesting. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, our next question today um, is, um, are um, silver ions more toxic um, than silver nanoparticles, and can you distinguish are they indistinguishable from each other? Right, right. So, so there's 
So in terms of mass loading, silver, um, so like silver salts um, are more toxic than silver nanoparticles, and that's shown over and over again. And that, uh, um, yeah, the silver ions themselves have, you know, in some cases, an order of magnitude higher toxicity than the the silver nanoparticles on from a, from a mass basis. That said, the silver nanoparticles are a high surface area source for silver ions, and so. By, by having silver nanoparticles, um, what can happen is you can transport those nanoparticles to a location and then they will basically be continuously releasing the, uh, the silver ions. And the, um, the second part of that question is, well, well how do you tell the, the difference? And we have a number of ways of doing that. In, in some cases, we can, um, we can measure in a given solution of silver nanoparticles, there's going to be a certain fraction that are in the solid silver nanoparticle state, and there'll be a certain fraction that are in the ionic form. And so it's possible to measure that. And typically what we'll do is we'll either hard spin or filter out the silver nanoparticles, and then we'll measure that supernate. Um, or permeate from the from the filters and uh, do ICP mass spec, and then we can get the split between um, what the uh, what the silver ion concentration is and what the silver nanoparticle concentration is. And one control that some nanotoxicologists do is they figure out what that split is, and then they'll actually add as a separate experiment the same amount of silver ions into that solution, and so then they can tease out what's the uh, what's the ultimate effect of you know both silver particles and silver ions, and then just the silver ions at that concentration alone to to learn something about that system? There's, an, there's a new technique of uh, single particle ICP mass spec, and that's where you can launch individual particles into an ICP mass spec, and it'll give you actually that split, that that solid particle concentration and that ion um, solution in the same measurement. Great. Um, our next question comes um, from Anthony. Um, <clears throat> why is it that positive nanoparticles are more, more toxic than negative ones? Yeah, I think it's complex. Um, you know, like, like quat ammonium, uh, you know, compounds are, are typically used for you know antimicrobial type of things, and I think it has to do with sort of the the effect of, of how those those some of those cations are interacting with materials. You know, the, the basic Thing that's that's seen is that it, it just most things in a in a uh, in a negative um, or in a in a biological system for whatever reason have um, uh, have a negative charge and so if you've got a positively charged particle and it can actually stick or interact with the you know the thing the the element of interest then typically that that particle now that it's on the surface has a higher chance of uptake and or if it's if it's releasing silver ions now it's releasing silver ions very locally to the surface of, of that entity and can induce a, a higher level of toxicity. Great. Well, I think uh, that concludes our question and answer uh, section for today. Um, I'd like to thank you, Steve, for sharing this valuable information to our audience, and I'd like to thank everyone again for attending. If you have any additional questions um, that that you did not ask on our live recording, you may reach our technical uh, support um, at uh, the email provided on the screen, which is info at nanocomposites.com. Um, and on behalf of Nanocomposites and our presenter, Dr. Stephen Olderberg, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today.